see so many new f old friends, and I'm sure that in the next three days we'll make some new ones. So thank you, Emmanuel, to you and your team for making this possible. I'd like to tell you a story. First, this slide has my name on it, but it was prepared by Professor Singer, this particular talk, from his online teaching course, and it will give you details of that towards the end, and any of you can access that. Albert mentioned that principles and options were two words which mean something very similar. And I was reminded of a story which Professor Diakimanolis may have to translate for me. Is there a difference in, in the word Greek for complete and finished? Uh, do you have two separate words for what we would call? Well, we would say complete is where it's a satisfactory end, a good ending, and we're very happy with it. But sometimes we use the word finished to mean everything has gone very badly wrong and your life is ended. And the story I was about to tell you to explain the difference. If you meet the right woman, the correct woman, and marry her, your life is complete, wonderful. If you meet the wrong woman and marry her, your life is finished. <laughs> but if the right woman finds you with the wrong woman, your life is completely finished. <laughs> So, options and principles. I think that before we can talk about the treatment of pre-malignant disease, we have to understand what the normal and the abnormal cervix looks like. Um, here we go. Why do we have to treat? What is the intention of treating? Well. When you travel to many parts of the world, for example to uh, India, to many parts of Africa, we could walk into a gynecology outpatient clinic and you can guarantee there will be at least one woman there with advanced cancer of the cervix. Albert was telling me last night of a country which was given $10 million from America to help prevent cervical cancer in a part of northern India. And do you know what they did? They spent the money on robotic surgery, minimal access equipment, and there was no screening. They made no effort to detect and treat pre-malignant disease. And that to me just seems crazy, that in many parts of the world, when you find that you have cervical cancer, what it tells you is that you will die from it. Sometimes it's so advanced that radiotherapy is of no value. Sometimes there is no radiotherapy. All we want to hear about sometimes are bigger and better op operations. And I sometimes think that when I, I did radical cancer surgery, Albert did it, Prof. Diakimanolis did it, Sometimes I think we do bigger and better, so-called better operations, and it's for the benefit of the surgeon and not necessarily for the benefit of the woman. And as I reached the end of my operating career, I became less and less radical because I did not think it was doing the best thing for the woman. Which brings us back to what this course is about today and the next two days. How can we prevent cancer. Cancer of the cervix is largely a preventable disease. And I remember being at a meeting in one of the Eastern European countries some time ago, and they asked me to speak on modern treatment of advanced cervical cancer. Of course, we could all talk about that. But my message was, we should not be treating advanced cervical cancer. My question to you not to you, but to this audience, is if you have advanced cervical cancer, why does that woman have it? Why did you not prevent it? Advanced cervical cancer is our fault because we do have the opportunity to prevent it from happening. So the aim of treatment is to identify pre-malignant disease, pre-cancer, 
and then, if necessary, to treat it. But one of the messages you'll have from this course and tomorrow is that just because a woman has pre-cancer, sometimes the best management option is to do nothing. And as doctors, we're not good at saying, just wait, let us see what happens. Be reassuring to tell the woman that to not treat is sometimes the best way forward. And that's what we're, we're talking about here. So the aim of treatment of pre-malignant disease is first, if we have low-grade disease, can we just leave this, monitor, come back in six months, come back in one year, and then we'll see, and if the problem persists, then we'll discuss uh, treatment. On the other hand, if we have high-grade disease, then some form of treatment is necessary. And if we're treating high-grade disease, then one thing we have to say is, how do we treat it? Do we destroy it? Uh, do we remove it? But the important part of treatment is that all of the abnormal lesion should be removed. And one thing which we will talk about is how to identify where the abnormality is and how do we remove all of it. Because if you have residual disease, if your treatment has not removed the lesion completely, then this makes it much more likely that the woman will develop problems in the future. There's also the question of the age of the woman. And in young women, it is very important that we avoid treatment if necessary. And that is because we all know that if you excise pre-malignant disease of the cervix, then this makes it more likely that that young woman, when she becomes pregnant, will have a premature birth. So what do we have to do before we treat? The first thing is we have to be sure in our mind that to treat this woman is the best thing for her. It's all too easy to say we can see something abnormal, it's very easy to treat, why don't we treat it? But you know, if you treat something and it's not necessary, even if you treat something when it is necessary, it has a psychological impact on that woman. And there have been many studies now which show that when a woman is called to have colposcopy, then it has a bad effect on her psychosexual attitude to life and to her partner. So with colposcopy, we have the opportunity to assess the woman. We can say, is there an abnormality? And where is it? And what is it? Is it low-grade or high-grade disease? Albert mentioned the words LSIL, low-sil, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and high-grade, high-sil, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Well, I think when we talk about our cases today, perhaps it's as well just to say, is it low-grade or high-grade? And this is much better than the CIN1, CIN2, CIN3, as we'll tell you. If we are treating, then we have to be sure that the patient, the woman, is being treated in a good environment. Do we have good anesthesia? Do we have good colposcopy? Can we see everything that we're supposed to see? Then counselling. Something we often forget. And, you know, when a woman comes into your clinic and she's been told that she has an abnormal pap test. She doesn't want to know about low-grade, high-grade glandular disease, how extensive it is. She does not want to know what type of transformation zone she's got. She thinks, doesn't she? Doctor, have I got cancer? It's often still called a cancer test, which is not a good, good way. But we have to be aware that the woman who comes into our colposcopy clinic with abnormal pap test is very worried in case she has cancer. And finally, number five here, we can't emphasize enough that if we do treat, then how do we know that treatment has been successful? And the only way we can do that is to ensure that the woman comes back to us for checking after she's been treated, whether it's colposcopy and cytology, whether it includes HPV testing, all of these things. But it's our responsibility to make sure that she comes back. 
<coughs> and audit of our work is actually quite important because I think all of us feel that we treat the woman in the best possible way. But unless we collect our results and compare them with the best that, for example, Professor Diakamanolis has or Albert Singer has, how do we know that we're treating these people properly? So adequate follow-up and audit of our own work. Who should we treat? We're, in, we're agreed that the reason we're here today is to find ways to prevent women from developing cervical cancer and more particularly from dying from cervical cancer. And that's where screening enters into this, whether it's by cytology, HPV testing, or both. And where does corposcopy fit into this? But our objective is to prevent that woman from developing cervical cancer. So who do we treat? Well, let's say the non-pregnant, the pregnant patient is very different. Uh, and many of us would feel that it's not necessary to investigate or to treat while the woman is pregnant unless there's a really good e reason to do so. So we're concentrating on the non-pregnant woman. Always we would treat high-grade disease, CIN3. Usually we would treat CIN2, which is also high SIL. Normally we would not treat CIN1, which is low SIL, but how do we tell the difference? And with colposcopy and with pathology, the definition, the diagnosis of CIN3 is usually easy. With low-grade disease, it's usually easy. And the main thing is that with low-grade disease, nowadays we say, don't treat unless we have a good reason to treat this woman with low-grade disease. The problem at the minute seems to be the so-called CIN2. How do we know whether CIN2 is genuinely high-grade? Or, in many cases, it disappears by itself. So why do we treat CIN2 and 3 or high-grade or high sil? Because if untreated, there is a likelihood that that woman will develop cancer. But another thing which is sometimes helpful is if you have a younger woman, say, under the age of 40, and you ask the question, will this high-grade lesion be cancer in six months or one year from now? The answer almost invariably is, no, it won't. It can become cancer at some time. But the reason that it's often helpful for us to say to ourselves, will this be cancer in one year, is because that removes the pressure to treat today or even next week. Now, why should it be treated? Because we know that at least one-third, 30% of CIN3, of high-grade disease, will become malignant, but over a period of many years. And what I would say to my patients is that sometime over 10, 20, 30 years, this might, but may not, this might become cancer, and that's why we have to treat. And the minimum age, if you look at all of the studies, is about seven years, but that includes women who are young, who will have a longer period of time, and women who are over 40, perhaps, and will have a shorter period of time. Just histologically, remember, CIN, or high-grade disease, is something the pathologist tells us, not the cytologist, not the HPV test, and not the colposcopist. <laughs> Albert mentioned that when we look at an abnormal cervix, all we can say is this looks like it may be CIN2 or 3, or it may be CIN1, but the diagnosis rests with the pathologist. And the main problem is not the, CIN, the, the low SIL, it's not the CIN3 or high SIL, it's this group in the middle, which is CIN2. And we know that many CIN2 lesions will regress if we do nothing. And the statistics which we quote now is that almost half of CIN2 lesions will regress and become perfectly normal if we do nothing. Uh, on the other hand, about one in three will persist, but we know that 5% will develop invasive disease. Now, what we say to our patient is important. If you say to your patient, look, you've got what we call CIN2, and if we don't treat, 
you have a 5% chance of this becoming cancer, what will she say? She say, well, treat it, doctor. If, on the other hand, you say to her, look, you've got what we call CIN2, and almost half of women with CIN2 find the lesion disappears if we do nothing, then she would say, well, what would you suggest? And therefore, what we feel is important. And I have to say that in many places we go to, that because a lesion has a 5% chance of becoming cancer, doctors will say, we must treat. But increasingly now, we're finding what is best for the woman. She doesn't need to have treatment in every case. Can we just wait? Which brings us back to the question of, will this lesion be cancer in one year from now? And that's often helpful to us. But the way that we present it is actually very important to the woman. And the reason that Albert has prepared this slide, and you may say, oh God, that's out of focus. And that's because often it is blurred. Sometimes it's not clear which is which. The pathology of CIN2 has been reviewed and there have been many studies. And it's this old question of if you show the same pathologist the same slide in one year or six months, will their diagnosis be the same? And this was a large study in which lay patients had been labeled with CIN2 and they found that when the same slides were reviewed, only 43% remained as CIN2. 29% were downgraded to CIN1 or normal. But one in four, 27%, were upgraded. So the pathologist is sometimes not sure. And that's why for clinicians, it's very important that we give them the best possible biopsy. And you speak to your pathologists, and they say, well, sometimes we just get a piece of tissue which is epithelium but no stroma. So they can't give you a diagnosis. So I would say to you, when you're taking a biopsy from the cervix, just remember the pathologist. And I used to do my own pathology in the early days. And then I used to know <laughs> that the biopsy, the quality of the biopsy was very important. That the quality of the biopsy, of the, of the report, depends on the quality of the biopsy. A good biopsy with lots of stroma. Um, the Lud A genital squamous terminology project shows that the histology will reflect the two-tiered cytology. So the cytologists are now talking about low-grade, high-grade, low-sill, high-sill. The one A to diagnosing whether CIN2 is significant and should be really CIN uh, labeled high grade is by doing a P16 test and if you do a P16 test and I'll show you in a minute if it's positive then that is high grade if P16 is negative then it becomes low grade so the pathologist has a way of, 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 of diagnosing this for example here normal squamous epithelium this was, these two lesions were, this was diagnosed as low grade, by the way, low seal, sorry. P16 was negative. And you see the P16 here shows differentiation of these cells going way up to the surface. So that was then labeled high grade. So that by doing this simple test of P16, which every laboratory can do if they wish, then what is CIN2 is either not significant or it's significant. We'll just. So, what should we treat or should we not treat CIN2? Now, again, the age of the woman is actually quite important here. So, we have to look at every parameter, the age, the corposcopic findings, the cytology findings, uh, the pathology findings, put everything together. And in a young woman who will, I say young, this is a woman who probably will be wanting children or more children. Uh, it's very possible for CIN2 lesions, even P16 positive, to have treatment delayed until after their pregnancy is complete, provided that they're monitored. But the use of P16, for example, may indicate which will progress and therefore help us which should be treated. And we mentioned here the word multidisciplinary team. 
And I think those of us who are used to working in groups with cytologists, pathologists, uh, with clinicians, and also with psychologists, uh, will say that with difficult cases, we should discuss all of them and then reach a consensus opinion as to what is the right thing to do. And sometimes when we're working uh, in private practice, for example, access to colleagues is quite difficult. We have to be aware of that. But in difficult cases, it's always helpful to discuss cases with colleagues. Now, to come back to CIN1, a low-grade disease, should we treat or should we not treat? Why should we treat at all? This is the classic study which was produced in 1995, and it showed that CIN1 lesions, stroke HPV, uh, regressed in over half, persisted in one in three, but progressed only in 14%. So we come back to the question of if you see a lesion which is low grade, cytology low grade, colposcopy low grade, biopsy low grade, will this woman have cancer in one year? And we'd all say, no, she won't. And therefore, it's quite in order to say we suggest that you're at no risk, come back, and the lesion will probably have disappeared. So we must remember that. So it's a question of observation or immediate treatment. And you can see the advantages and the disadvantages. Uh, we hear people saying, well, we have a woman here with low-grade disease. We may never see her again. If we say come back in one year, either she won't come back, or perhaps she'll go and see somebody else who will say, I think you should treat this. That actually, around the world, is a very valid complication. That we need to say to the woman, look, this is what you've got, but please be reassured that you are at no risk of developing cancer in the foreseeable future, and therefore this will likely disappear, and therefore we leave well alone. But we have to consider other factors. Can we see the entire lesion? Is it satisfactory? In other words, is it an adequate corposcopy? Can we see the entire transformation zone? Can we see the entire lesion? Because if we can't see all of the lesion, some of it goes into the canal, we don't know what's inside. We can only biopsy what we can see. And that's the unsatisfactory, or you'll hear later, the type 3 transformation zone. So in summary, surveillance or just watching CIN1 is standard advice. But you can treat and probably should treat under certain circumstances and the one which we've put down here is persistence. So if over a period of one or two or three years the woman persists in having low grade disease, well that would be an indication to discuss treatment with her. But in the under 35 we're aware of the effect of any form of treatment on uh, reproductive potential, the risk of premature labor, and therefore we have to bear that in mind. So the assessment of the woman with any disease depends, the management depends, on good colposcopy. And the stress is on good colposcopy because as colposcopists we have to be confident in the way in which we can diagnose. Now there are various methods of treatment which I think you're all aware of, so we'll go through these quickly and then we can have some questions. How to treat. There's the anatomy of treatment, and Albert mentioned the fact that some of the lesions go below the surface, sometimes for a depth of up to four millimeters, so we have to take that into account. We also have to say, how big is the lesion? Does it go to the vagina, or is it only on the cervix? Depth of crypt involvement, you've heard. And here you see the lesion going below the surface here. So that any treatment has to be able to destroy down to about five millimeters. Um, methods of treatment. Colposcopy is essential. And Albert will tell you, we, we go to some places where uh, colposcopy is not used. Or where somebody will use a colposcope to make a diagnosis, but do not use a colposcope to do their treatment. I find that inconceivable that you have a colposcope, how do you know how much to destroy or to remove without using colposcopy? And we all know that we can use radical diathermy, 
which was a, a needle diathermy. Uh, it was pioneered in Australia in the late 60s and early 70s, and it still has the best results in the world. Laser, cold coagulation, cryocautery, or we can excise by large loop excision, needle, knife cone biopsy, laser cone, or hysterectomy. <clears throat> the ablative techniques, uh, laser, cryo, diathermy, and cold coagulation. But, and they're all very good, and cold coagulation and cryocautery are now being used again. But the prerequisite is that if you ablate, you must be able to see the entire lesion, the total transformation zone. There is no evidence of glandular abnormality on cytology, that cytology and colposcopy do not show any suggestion of invasive disease, and where the histology and the cytology agree, and only then can you do ablative techniques. And I would add further to that, that ablative techniques should be used only by anyone who feels that they are, however you define, a competent or experienced colposcopist. <coughs> so there's biopsy, vaporization. We've seen all the lasers that uh, Prof. Diakimanolis is an expert in this. Laser vaporization, cryocautery, we know that, and that's becoming very popular again. Um, but cold coagulation was used, it was pioneered by uh, SEM in, in, in Hamburg, and then Duncan in Scotland used it, and people said it can't be any good, but now the um, systematic review shows that it's good. And this is a new cold coagulator which has been developed by IFCPC, the International Federation. And it's battery operated, simple to use, and in third world countries this will be a huge advantage. So in summary, local destruction in good hands can give excellent results. Excision, you know all of these, we use a large loop. Uh, we have to decide what type of transformation zone, and we'll be hearing more of this in the next two days. If it's just here on the outside, a small loop. If it goes into the canal, a slightly larger loop. If you cannot see the entire lesion because it goes too far up the canal, then it has to, it has to take that into account. But the aim is always we should treat the whole transformation zone. And the special considerations excise the entire transformation zone and minimize the artifactual damage. And by that means, means we can cauterize after the loop has been done. But the more you cauterize, the more damage that you are doing to the cervix. And here you see we've mentioned special considerations must be performed under colposcopic vision. And it's very easy to see how you can use a colposcope to look at it, apply some iodine, take the colposcope away, and, and, and then try to do a loop excision. I would urge you not to do that. It's very easy to learn how to do these things looking through the colposcope and using the colposcopic direction to tell you how much to remove. And we all know these, and the success of treatment. Interestingly, there are very few large randomized control trials and there's no difference in terms of success, success, success except for cryotherapy and therefore when we say an ideal method does not exist what we're saying is that if Prof. Diakimanolis, Professor Singer was sent to an area or a clinic and he was told all you have is a laser to excise or destroy or you have only cryocautery, or only cold coagulation, or only a knife cone, then whatever method of treatment they used, they would get good results. So the best results come not from the method of treatment that you're using, but from the, cop the experience of the colposcopy. And just, we're using now HPV as a test of cure, which we'll talk more about that. Complications, preterm labor, a blade of treatment, there's no risk of preterm labor, but there is with excisional methods. And basically, cervical cancer can be prevented. And the best way to do this is not to have better, method, better means of treating cancer of the cervix, but to prevent it. But most important is to know when we do not need to treat. And that depends on the skill 
the, the colposcopist. Thank you, Chairman.